dynamic programming at ease with grammars, algebras, products. I'm very happy to be here and talk about dynamic programming today. Um, but first of all, why? Why do we want to do dynamic programming? We want to do this to solve combinatorial optimization problems. Um, these problems, they have a combinatorial part. That means we have some counting to do. We have to enumerate all possible solutions of a recursive kind of problem. And then we have the optimization part. So we have to find a desired solution. Whatever desired means for us. It could be that we want the maximum of some score or something like that. Um, examples for these kind of problems uh, would be the Borgel problem, where you are given a grid of letters, characters, let's say a 4x4 four four grid, and you have a dictionary of words that you're supposed to find in there. And you can have all these movements on the grid, they are, uh, they are allowed, but you just cannot return to where you came from. So how do you enumerate these words in an optimal way? Um, Another really nice example is the money changing problem. I think it's the smallest problem that I could find that can be solved by dynamic programming. That's why we're going to use it as an example. So imagine you have an amount of money, let's say $5, and you have some coins. Let's say you have $1, $3, and $4. How can you decompose this value of money? Um, another example that we use quite often in bioinformatics is uh, text or sequence alignment. Um, that we uh, use to see how similar uh, sequences are. So we would use this for biosequences. So for example, for DNA. So how similar is my DNA to the DNA of a mouse? Um, and another example from bioinformatics would be RNA structure prediction. So the prediction of the structure of a molecule, uh, which can form base pairs uh, when it's folding back onto itself. Um, but let's get started with some classical dynamic programming. Um, I don't know how many of you did some dynamic programming before. Maybe you want to raise your hand. Oh, quite a few. That's good. But we're going through it like really, really quickly. Um, so if I want to solve a dynamic programming problem um, and I go open my algorithms book, it will tell me you have to do these four steps to solve it. So if you think about the money changing problem, and as I said, um, we have our coins here. Uh, so we have one, three, and four dollars. And we have this amount of money, um, five. Um, first of all, the first step that my algorithms book said is characterize the structure of an optimal solution. So if I want to decompose this uh, number five, um, my optimal solution would be a sum, right? And it would be a sum that's composed of these values of the coins, one, three, and four. So it's some weighted kind of sum. Um, OK, the second step, recursively define the value of an optimal solution. How do we do that? recursively define it. Uh, we do that with something that we also call uh, recurrences. So these are equations um, that have the same term uh, reoccurring on the right side. So there's some recursive definition going on. And for our money changing problem, this would be the recurrence. So we could define dn in terms of some smaller subproblems. And because we want to have a sum, uh, we could say if we just, if we just subtract one of the coins. So for example, we subtract minus one or minus three or minus four, um, we would get a smaller subproblem. So we would have a smaller sum that we then have to decompose. And if we are at zero, we are done. This is our base case because zero, we cannot decompose it further. Um, okay, the next step would be uh, to compute the value of an optimal solution. So let's keep in mind we want to count the ways how to how to uh, decompose the $5. How many ways are there? <laughs> and we usually, in dynamic programming, we, uh, we do this with a table, and we do this in a bottom-up fashion. So here, we can have our table, and the value n, it goes up to 5, because this is the sum we want to decompose. This is the final problem we want to solve. And then for a d, um, we, are going to, uh, we are going to write down the solution for that particular sum. So uh, if we want to fill this table, we can follow these arrows. So I made these arrows to make it, make it a bit easier. So uh, for the $1, we just have steps of 1. So it's kind of easy. For the $3, we are going from n, like, and then n is 0 to n is 3, and from 1 to 4, and so on. And then for the $4, we only have these two arrows <laughs> left. And then um, how do we get these six paths? So every time we are filling a cell, every time we are drawing a new arrow, we have to keep in mind how many ways were there before to go to that path. So that's how we come up with this solution of six. And then there's the fourth step, which is usually the complicated step, 
construct an optimal solution from the computed information. So we, how do we get our sums back? <laughs> if we have the six, uh, how do I get my sums out of it? What do they look like? So I have to somehow go from the last position in the table backwards and figure out all these ways in which my solution was built up. And that's usually a complicated step. So and in this kind of problem here, in the money chaining problem, uh, in, this, in this kind of question I posed, uh, there's not even an optimization step. We are simply, simply following all of the paths. But we could as well say we just want to have the minimum number of coins to decompose this. So that sounds great. Good news, everyone. Dynamic programming solves optimization problems over a large, that means exponential, search space in a reasonable amount of time, which, which means polynomial, so it's tractable by a computer. But there's a huge but. <laughs> it's not that easy, actually. Um, the development of successful dynamic programming recurrences is a matter of experience, talent, and luck, is what we always said in our work group. <laughs> so actually, it's really hard to get it right. So um, this kind of problem was really small. We had a small table, it just was one dimension. So that was kind of easy to see. But imagine the table could be two-dimensional or even four-dimensional, or we could have multiple tables, and then it just gets really hard. Um, so how can we alleviate this? We came up with a new way to reason about dynamic programming and to um, yeah, even automate the, all the ugly parts of it. So this is going to be great. Um, uh, how do we do this? First of all, we will start with an example. And then we will, le we will learn that candidates are trees, questions are algebras, and programs are grammars. And then we can also learn about products, which uh, really give us a lot of power and make these computations fun. So let's start with an example. Life, the universe, and all the rest. Um, and for this example, I want you to forget everything that you know about dynamic programming. Forget everything. Uh, forget about the money changing problem. Just think we have some magical device that lets us see at each step how is the score of our uh, solution of the dynamic programming problem and how does the solution that we constructed look like. So we have some ma magic output device to see this. And um, let's say we just, get this, uh, we just get this answer, it's 42. We don't know what it is yet. But we can use our magic device to find out what was the question, what actually happened here. Let's do this, let's go back one step. Oh, there's a funny tree. So we have a funny tree which has some match at the top and then has some outermost children which say S. And there's a lower score now which says 28. So what's actually happening here? We don't know yet, but we are going to write it down. So we are going to write down this little <laughs> equation. Um, and because it's not uh, that easy to write down a tree, we just write it, write it like this, like a formula. We write match AXA. Because there's some letter, we don't really care what this letter is. It just seems to be matching. So it's the same letter A. And then there's some X in the middle, which we also don't know yet what it is. But we know what's happening with the score, right? We know that there's some plus 14 going on. Because before it was 42, and now it's 28. OK, let's go one step further. Oh, another ma match appeared. And actually, what happened here is we can use the same equation to write it down. So there seems to be a reoccurring thing. We figured something out. And some st is at the side of some st. What's going on? Let's go back a few more steps. Oh, there's uh, something crazy happening now. There's, uh, there's some divergence going on. There seems to be a choice. There's a maximum going on. So we have two different scores. In the left side, we have 14. In the right side, we have minus 13. Um, so there's a choice going on of the maximum score. Let's write that down. So we write down in the, in the bottom choice of the maximum score. Very interesting. So what's going to be happening in the next step? Why are these two numbers different? Uh, it's actually something different happening in the both branches now. Let's have a look. OK. Actually, that's true. There are two different things happening. So in the left side, there's happening an insertion. And in the right side, there's happening a replacement. So we can read now from the top at these uh, trees. We can read there's something like ST is going to be matched with STR. Or in the right side, there's STL and STR. What's going on? That seems very interesting. So we are writing down insert. Insert is happening and costs us minus 2. And replace, replacement of two different letters, L and R. This cost is minus one. So let's fast forward a bit, because we know now how this works. 
uh, we do a bunch of insertions at once, and we do a bunch of replacements at once. And now we can see actually there's a string alignment going on. There's a string alignment going on of st and strange in the left tree. And then in the right tree, there's something going on like St. Louis and strange. Very interesting. And we can see that the left tree has an overall higher score, and the right tree has a lower score. Um, and in the same time, we can also, again, uh, write down what happened, but we can see the insertion and the replacement is still the same as in the previous steps. OK, let's do this all the way to the end. Um, and we can see St. Louis and Strange Loop. We have two different kind of alignments. So first of all, in the left side, um, we had all these insertions at first. And then we have the two matches there of the LO, which are very important because they give us a high score. So this seems to be the winner because of these two matches. And in the right side, we did all these replacements, and then we did some insertions. And then there's this empty thing at the end where the alignment ends. OK, very interesting. What happened? We found two alignments of St. Louis and Strange Loop, and they are quite different. As I said, the um, first one, it wins because it has these two extra matches there. And the second one, it loses. It has a score of only 15. But what we can see from this, or what we can learn from this, is that each alignment and score are represented by the same formulas, the formulas we've, we've written down in the process. So let's summarize this reverse engineering exercise. Uh, the result of a dynamic programming algorithm is the value of a formula which is built from evaluation functions, which are the functions that take us from the tree to that number that's yellow. <laughs> And they are interleaved with applications of a choice function. And the choice function, in our case, it was this maximum <coughs> function, which was appearing there. The maximum function that's selected between the left and the right tree. And um, what we can also see is that the applications of the choice function seem to propagate to the top. So at the top, we knew that we'd take this 42 branch. Um, what we also see is that formulas are candidate solu uh, solutions. With formulas, I mean now trees. We can see it as a tree or as a formula in the way we write it down. And then um, input sequences are also part of the formula. So when we read around the leaves of the tree, um, we call this the yield. And this is actually the input sequence to my algorithm. So the two input sequences were strange loop and St. Louis in our case. OK, let's reverse engineer this reverse engineering. From this, we can deduce a procedure, how to solve a dynamic programming problem. So first of all, um, we said the first step, the input sequence can be found at the leaves. Let's do this first. We read at first the input sequence, right? And from the input sequence, we construct all candidate solutions as formulas. And then what we do is we move the applications of the choice function, which was the maximum function, down. We push it down inside the formulas as fast as possible, uh, as far as possible. And then um, we also evaluate the formulas to get the desired result, so to get our number 42 in our example. Candidates are trees. What do I mean by this? <laughs> Let's see. So if we, if we think a bit about our method, um, several steps of the method can be automated. Um, the steps of reading in the input, applying the choice function, and evaluating, they are always the same. So we could automate them and write a program to do that. Um, the talents and experience, uh, we want to get rid of the luck, <laughs> go into constructing of the candidates. Constructing of the candidates means uh, how do I decompose my problem into sub-problems? Which candidates arise for a specific given input? So how do I decompose my problem then? And also, what does a desired candidate look like? What's a good candidate and what's a bad candidate? What do I want here? How do I score it so the good candidates come up? Um, and to do this, to express the candidate construction, we need some kind of language for formulas, or we could also say for trees. The good thing is we have such a language, and with this language, uh, constructing candidates can also be automated. That's really great, because this means we get everything for free, except for the creative part, where we think about the decomposition of the problem and these kind of things. Actually, we don't get it all for free, because we wrote a compiler to do this for us, and we wrote the third <laughs> generation of this compiler, so we put a lot of work into it, but you get an idea. <laughs> OK, let's talk about the first building block of our, of our little programming language that I'm going to show you. The signature. 
So when we think about the alignment, we wrote down these uh, reoccurring uh, functions for the replacement, deletion, insertion, and also the match, which I'm going to include into the replacement from now on, because there's the same number of arguments. Um, and then there's this empty thing and the choice function, which we also talked about. Choice was the maximum for us, right? And this is an abstract descript uh, a description of this. So we are saying we don't know what the answer looks like, but we know it has this kind of form. So we could say the signature is some kind of data type at the root of every dynamic programming problem. So we could say um, this data type, usually we just don't see it. In the normal dynamic programming approach, um, these candidates are never represented, so we never see this data type. But in our style, we can actually write it down and it helps us. This helps us to reason about the problem. So my favorite part, questions are algebras. So when I can, uh, can build now my search space, because I have some magic way to describe my candidates and they are built, I don't know how yet. Um, how do I actually ask a question? How do I say, give me please the maximum of this, um, the maximum scoring alignment, for example? Uh, this we can do with evaluation algebras. Um, so this happens in the evaluation phase. What's happening there exactly? So they're happening two things. Uh, there's the scoring of the candidates and there's also the making of choices. And these two things, uh, they are all encompassed in an evaluation algebra, which is just a bunch of functions. Uh, functions for scoring and functions for the choice uh, and one function for the choice. Um, what this is, we will see it later. Um, let's talk about the choice functions first. So in our example from the beginning, um, the choice function was the maximum function, right? Uh, so we were looking for the maximum scoring alignment. Um, and, but in fact, there's a variety of choice functions. We could come up with whatever we like. Um, what all of these functions have in common is that um, they, they, map a set, uh, they map a list of values to a list of values, which could be in the end only maybe a list of one value if we were looking for the maximum. So we can see the maximum, it's very popular. <laughs> and the minimum, it's also very popular. But what happens then if you say, I can give you the best one, then comes somebody from your next office and says, oh, give me the five best ones. So you have this max k, which is also very popular. Uh, you could also do an enumeration, so you could have the identity function. You just keep everybody. This is interesting to inspect the entire space, but could be very costly because you have to enumerate them all. And then you can do all kinds of combinatorics. The simplest form would be just summing up uh, everything in the entire space. Um, uh, also, what you could do is sampling, and then it gets really interesting. So you have some random choice from your, from your, from your search space. Um, also scores, let's talk about scores. Scores can also be very versatile, they can be anything. So they can be a distance or similarity uh, between substructures. That's what we use for the alignment, right? So we said uh, we give it a similarity score. But we could also say um, we give it some probabilities if we have a probabilistic model. Or we could say we have the minimum free energy, so we, we have a thermodynamic model. For example, when we want to fold molecules in bioinformatics, we use this. We could also say we just want to see the candidates. What do the candidates actually look like? Um, if we want to see them as strings or as trees or just uh, put them as a graphical representation to put them in our publication. Um, and then we could just count the candidates. So before printing them all, maybe it makes sense to see how big the search space is. Maybe it's too big to print it out and it's not a good idea. Okay, how does the scoring of alignments work? Um, this works with the algebra, um, the scoring algebra, evaluation algebra. Um, and here we see, when we look at it, we see um, algebra score implements a line. So it's implementing our signature. It knows exactly what functions uh, should be in this algebra. It works only when I, when I have all these functions ready. So I have replacement, deletion, insertion, and empty. And uh, you can see the scoring happens here, and it quite fits um, what we have seen in our reverse engineering exercise. Um, and then when we evaluate, uh, we could say uh, we have our formula here. This would be our candidate for 42. I just flattened the tree for us and shortened the m's because it wouldn't fit on the slide. But you can read St. Louis and Strange Loop backwards. And we get 42. So this is something you can imagine a way we could put it in a computer like this. Okay, what's also really great about the, um, about the algebras, the scoring algebras, is um, they are very versatile. Um, we could um, 
uh, easily have variants of the problem. So we could say we vary our problem, we want to have a fine gap cause. So if we open something with an insertion and deletion in our, in one, in our alignment, so if we open a gap, as we call it, uh, we want to uh, make it cheaper to open, uh, to extend the gap and um, more expensive to open it. So it's easier to have like uh, one big gap than scattered small gaps. And uh, this could be done by just adding two extra functions to the algebra. So we would have something like delete extend and insert extend. And I could also uh, do the same thing if I wanted to make my alignment local. Um, so if I don't want to align the entire string, but I could say give me the best local match in it. That means I can arbitrarily skip something in one of the strings, the input strings. So I need functions for this, skip left, skip right. Or I could combine the two. Um, let's talk about RNA. <laughs> that's my favorite topic, that's what I did my PhD on. Um, so this is an RNA molecule. Um, it has several building blocks. Um, it's a single-stranded molecule that folds back onto itself and forms these base pairings. So you see there, there's a single-stranded region in the bottom. It can have bulges. There's this big multi-loop which has many arms. There's a stacking region which is, uh, uh, which is entirely made out of base pairs that stack on each other. And then there's a hairpin loop which is like the end of this loop. So these are the building blocks of RNA. So if I think of uh, uh, how, how would I use this in an algebra now, uh, let's imagine we just want to print out this molecule with a string of dots and brackets. So every time we encounter a single-stranded region or something in a bulge that's not paired, we put a dot. And every time we have a base pair, we put a bracket. Like there's an opening bracket, for example, for this part, and then there's a closing bracket in the end of the string. Uh, so how would we do this with an algebra? Um, imagine we have, for our building blocks, we have functions. We abstracted it in a way. So we have SR as our function here, which is the stacking region. And we have HL for hairpin loop. And then uh, with these functions, we can say what the, what the algebra actually should do because it, could, uh, because it should print out um, the molecule in a way of dots and brackets. So we are telling it algebra pretty. We are telling it... Uh, for the, for the first term, um, which is the stacking region, we are just adding a base pair. So we are adding a base pair and then we're going on recursively. And the base pair is just the pair of brackets. And for the hairpin loop, which was this thing with the looping thing, we have a region of unpaired dots in the middle. So we have the size region construct, which is there in the middle. So um, as we can see, we can use this for, for extensive programs and complicated problems. And then let's say we just want to count the RNA structures. Then we actually don't have to write anything. It's very short. The compiler does it for us. We can say algebra my count, auto count. And then um, when we evaluate this, um, we saw that there's just one folding of it. And so for the counting, we would get one. It's just one structure. OK. Programs are grammars. Now, uh, this is the last part that's missing, right? How does this all work? It still doesn't fit together. There's a piece missing. Um, let's recapitu uh, recapitulate where do we stand. We know now how to represent candidates. We know now how to score and to choose the candidates. We still need to know which are the candidates for the given input, for a given problem instance. So if I have an input string, how do I get the tree out of it? Um, and we, uh, we do this using tree grammars. So I think uh, most people here, or I hope most people here are familiar with uh, string grammars. String grammars describe languages of strings. And from the string grammar, we can automatically derive a parser uh, which recognizes the strings that are in the language. And then it can say, oh, the string is in the language, or the string I reject is not in there. Um, and the tree grammar is actually a pretty similar thing. Uh, it describes a language of trees. So our candidates are trees, right? That's right what we need. Um, and these trees, they have input strings as their yield sequences. Remember, the yield sequence was what I read around the tree. Um, and what we call a yield parser is something that we can derive automatically from the grammar. Um, and it reads the yield, so it reads the input string, and generates the corresponding candidate. So it's generating the corresponding tree, which has the right sequence all around the leaves. How does this work? How does this work? How would such a grammar look like? Um, 
This is again actually a piece of code uh, which would uh, work with our compiler. Um, and this is a grammar for our alignment. Um, and this looks a bit like the grammars you know from theoretical computer science. So there's, um, so there's an alternative operator, we have, these, we have this clause here, we have an axiom where we start. Um, and then in the last line there's this uh, interesting thing, h. That's the objective function. That's the function, the maximum function from our first example, for example. Could be any other function that I want to optimize for. Um, but this is the application of the function, so it's applied to the entire clause. Um, and all these cases, replacement, deletion, and insertion, they are recursive. So you see there's the alignment, it's appearing in there again. So it's recursive. Um, and actually, this is how we would write it in the computer, but the way I have it in my head, it looks slightly different because I think in trees. So um, for me, it would look like this. Um, so the tree grammar would look like this. I have this one clause, which is just the alignment clause. I would have the little replacement tree, deletion tree, insertion tree, and empty. And in all these little trees, I could plug in another tree, and in this way, I could um, build a huge tree from it. So now we have all our building blocks together. Um, with all these building blocks together, uh, we have an evaluation signature, which we call sigma. We have a tree grammar, which we call G over sigma. And we have a concrete evaluation algebra, which we can call A, with an objective function H. Um, with all these parts together, um, I can make an algebraic dynamic programming algorithm. The thing that I can feed into my compiler and then it just works. Uh, but wait, what is this thing? Satisfying Bellman's principle. Let's look into this. Um, so Bellman's principle of optimality, it's actually really, really important. This is the thing why dynamic programming works. So um, Richard Bellman in 1964, the father of dynamic programming said, an optimal solution can be composed solely from optimal solutions to subproblems. Interesting. So if I think about this for a minute, in my own words, I would say something like, moving the choice function around in the formula should not affect the final result list. That means I can, if I have the, um, I, if I have the optimal uh, results and I combine them, it will always be optimal again. So where, where I choose, it doesn't really matter. I could push it down in my tree. Uh, the interesting thing is that this is a requirement. It's not a theorem, so we have to prove it. Um, we can prove this by proving the distributivity over the choice function uh, of the choice function over the scoring function. But actually for a maximum and stuff like that, it just holds. Mm. Okay, there's one last part we have to talk about to, uh, uh, to understand how this all works. Uh, that's the phase amalgamation part. So um, imagine we have given all our parts, uh, the grammar, the algebra, and the input string. Uh, we can just evaluate it and we get some value three. So let's, for example, say we are folding R and A. We are looking for how many base pairs are in the folded results and we get the result of three. So if we think about how this works in our conceptual view in our head, we would say, first of all, there's this yield parsing going on and it's constructing the space of candidates of all the trees, my search space. And then there's the second, uh, second phase where all these trees, they are transformed into numbers and then we choose the best one. But actually, that's not true. Actually, that's not true because it would be way too slow. In reality, both of these phases are merged um, to make dynamic programming possible and to make it fast. So we, as soon as we constructed uh, everything that's necessary, we, uh, we pick the optimal thing and we only keep that. That's why it's fast. So. Let's talk about products. We first revisit again where do we stand. Um, we can now describe algorithms on an abstract level. We can now generate correct and efficient code where well, the compiler does it. Um, we can independently vary the tree grammar or the evaluation algebra, so we could plug in another algebra if we wanted to. And we can run one analysis at a time. But uh, how about doing several analysis at a time? Wouldn't that be great? So for example, if we could compute the best, uh, best score of the alignment and then print the best scoring candidate, we could actually look at the alignment, what does it look like at the same time? Wouldn't that be great? Um, 
Or we could even ask a more difficult question. So let's say we compute the best RNA structure for each different abstract shape. So let's say one shape has three arms and one shape has <laughs> two arms. Uh, what does the best RNA structure for each of the shapes look like? Like with the ma maximum number of base pairs, for example. Uh, this we can do with products of algebras. So we define something which is the product operator. We just call it star here. Um, and we can give it two algebras and we get a new algebra out of it. And what does it do? It suddenly computes uh, pairs of answers. Um, and, it uses, uh, and it does this using just the functions which are the algebra functions from the two algebras that I put in. So it's combining the two algebra functions that I put in, component-wise, and then um, it's choosing in a dependent way. So it's choosing first uh, according to the first objective and then according to the second objective. Um, uh, the intuitive understanding of this, how does this work? We would again think there's two phases going on. So first of all, we compute all the candidates uh, via the uh, algebra functions, and then we apply this objective function H in the end. But in reality, it's the same thing as we talked about before. Uh, these phases are all interleaved. It's all happening at the same time. But we can write it down in this uh, really nice way um, and all separate uh, just because we came up with this formulation of it. So that's a real lux luxury to write it in this way. Um, what's also great about it is uh, we don't have to do any extra programming. We don't have to do any extra de debugging. We just have to make sure uh, that our combined algebra still satisfies Bellman's principle. So now we can do very many fun things with products because they are very powerful. So for example, uh, we could look, if we are solving an optimization problem, we, we could look at the number of co-optimal solutions. So we are looking at all the best solutions, for example. For example, when we're looking at the number of base pairs, we could count them. So um, how many of the structures have three base pairs? How many of the predicted structures have four base pairs? Or things like that. So we can get an overview of the entire space. So that's very interesting. Um, What's also great is the second point, uh, the easy candidate output. So it's easy to um, see at the same time the candidate. So the backtracking step, we suddenly get it for free. So if we look at the base pairs, for example, and then we print what does the actual folding look like, like at this, as this uh, string of dots and brackets as we are used to seeing it, we can actually see what does the folding look like with that best result. So we don't have to do the backtracking. Um, What's also really nice is the, uh, something we call classified dynamic programming. That's a bit like uh, combining the uh, previous ideas. So for example, we could um, ask a question uh, where the first algebra is just separating our search space into, into classes or into different spaces. So for example, we could say, we take the folding space with all the folded molecules in it, and we want to separate it by uh, shape, and then we want to count how many of these different shapes are in each of these groups. So we could do something like this with a shape star count one. Um, and then what we could also do is uh, we could ask uh, for each of the shape groups uh, which one of the, of the structures is the best one, which one has the uh, most uh, base pairs, for example. Um, uh, what it's also really useful for is for ambiguity checking. So if you want to check our grammar, if it's, if it's built in a good way, um, this can be really useful. So we can do just something like pretty print the uh, result, pretty print the candidate, and then count it. And it should be always one. If it appears twice, we did something wrong when we constructed our grammar. So we can work on that. Um, and also, uh, we can do sampling. So we have some other kinds of products, which I have no time to talk about today, unfortunately. But then it gets really powerful, because we can sample if the space is too big. Uh, we can sample from it. Or we can, have to, of course, do products of products. We can see this is a powerful technique. Um, so using algebraic dynamic programming, as we call it, uh, we de developed a bunch of tools. So this is not just theory. This is actually working. The compiler is working. Um, and we developed many tools with it. So this is just a bunch of uh, bioinformatics tools that we, um, that we developed. Uh, mostly they are in uh, RNA structure prediction and alignment. Um, but this is not the only, only problems you could solve with it. So we solved other problems with it, like the optimal matrix chain multiplication, for example, 
or the satisfiability problem. So it's not, it's not restricted to bioinformatics. I, and I encourage you to bring me your own problems. Um, so let's rec recapitulate what's cool about algebraic dynamic programming. Why do we want to do this? So we have a bunch of advantages that we have seen. Uh, our work is reduced to the creative aspects. So all these horrible parts like the table axis and whoever implemented uh, dynamic programming algorithms knows who I, what I'm talking about. You have to fiddle with index, indices of tables all the time. We don't have to do it. The compiler is doing it, which is a great relief. Um, and we have time to explore our ideas rather than debugging this uh, code, um, which is really great. We can focus on this creative part. Um, we create reusable and reliable components. So all these uh, algebras, we can plug them in and out. We can have different algebras that just give us the output or count or whatever uh, for the same grammar. And um, uh, this is completely composable. Um, we turn tricks into techniques. There's a lot of trickery in dynamic programming in the conventional way. Uh, and we make d dynamic programming easier to learn. I think we just have more, more words now to reason about it and take all these parts apart and talk about them separately. And disadvantages are, of course, textbooks still use old-fashioned recurrences. I had to dig to ma uh, through many pages of recurrences in my PhD. Um, uh, another disadvantage is it's limited to sequence-like data, um, and the problems, they decompose into subword-like structures. That's why it's so useful in bioinformatics, but I think it can be applied in other, um, uh, in other areas too. And actually, this limitation is just now in the compiler, but in theory, we already worked it out. It's way more powerful than that. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say today. So I'm, I'm thanking my work group, uh, the practi Practical Computer Science Group in Bielefeld, where, where I learned about these things. Um, and I worked on the compiler. Um, and remember the reverse engineering of 42 and talk to me about your favorite dynamic programming problem. So I want you, if you are interested in dynamic programming, uh, to come to me and uh, I would like to, to try to get it to work with our compiler to see more problems and see what's possible. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you.